Welcome to Climate Change and Health in Small Island Developing States. Focus on the Caribbean. If you require translation into Spanish or French, please use the link posted in the chat and choose your required language at the bottom of the Zoom screen. You should continue to keep this browser open as well to, use the, to utilize the chat and Q&A feature. Please be sure to scroll down and mute the video. Please use the Q&A feature to submit any questions for the panelists. This session is being recorded. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, or good evening, or good night, wherever you are. I am Karen Paulson Edwards, Advisor for Climate Change and Environmental Determinants of Health with the Pan American Health Organization. And it is my pleasure to moderate this session on vector borne diseases. Climate change is affecting the transmission of vector borne diseases in the Caribbean region. This session will therefore focus on the development of early warning systems for dengue and will examine challenges posed by hurricanes to vector control. This afternoon, I am joined by three distinguished panelists, Drs. Paula Ortiz, Anna Stewart Ibarra, and Jolion Medlock. Dr. Ortiz is a scientific leader of the Climate and Health Group and Focal Point Meteorology Institute, Cuba. And for over 20 years, he has developed spatial models to study the relationships between climate, human health, and infectious diseases. Dr. Stuart Ibarra is a scientific director of the Inter-American Institute for Global Change Research. Her research focuses on understanding climate, environment, and social drivers of vector-borne diseases and other dimensions of human well-being in Latin America and the Caribbean. Dr. Ibarra will speak on the co-creation of a dengue early warning system for the health sector in the Caribbean. And Dr. Jolion Medlock is head of medical entomology and zoonosis ecology, Public Health England or UK Health Security Agency. He leads a medical entomology group advising the UK government on vector borne disease risk, managing UK wide vector surveillance systems and research on mosquito and tick borne diseases, including impacts of environmental and climatic change. And this evening, Dr. Medlock will present on challenges posed by hurricanes to vector control. Dr. Ortiz is going to present first. He's not joining us live, but we have his recording and his presentation will be on Cuba's experience in implementation of an early warning system for the prediction of infectious diseases with an emphasis on dengue fever. Now for his presentation. Hello, thank you very much for the invitation. The object of my presentation is to show the Cuban experience in implementation of early warning system for the prediction of the infectious diseases with the emphasis in dengue fever. Next, please. As a result of the adaptation program to the impact of the climate variability and changing, Cuban has developed an early warning system for the infectious disease with the, a complex approach. Many studies to determine the influence of the climate variability of the infectious disease and their agent consider the use of the climate single variable, reducing its study to the variables at the precipitation and temperature. However, in our case, we work with approach of the compound variable with the legs to the formulation of the complex index, for example, Bhutto index. This approach permits to explain more consistently the effect of the climbing variability in the infection disease. The Bhutto index describes the climbing anomalies in the different scale, for the example, interannual, seasonal, and intraseasonal variability. The increment of the climbing variation can also generate ecological and socio-economical changes, and it 
can increase or decrease the incubation period and transmission of the pathogen organism. They are extremely sensitive to the climatic flood fluctuation. For example, in this case of the vertebral disease, the climbing influenza of the health is giving us the following three vibes distribution and quality of the sulfide water, life cycles of the disease vector and hot, vector resolution cheese, and ecosystem dynamic of the predator prey relation chip. The next please. This is a scheme described as the framework for developing climate prediction and early warning system and current infection diseases of in, in diseases included in early warning system cure. Surviving safety why critical. Often dogs do not provide a nailing time to take effect action when a disease outbreaks or score. And needing early warning system to current surviving program can reduce current and the future vulnerability to the climbing viability. Early one disease can provide necessary time for the population and relevant authority to detect preventive action. Such acts provide insecticide by big name and conducting indoor residuals training to the prevent a dengue epidemic. Any L1 system based on the environment monitoring variable needs to take in the, into consideration that there are way uncertainties about the weather prediction and accuracy. We should emphasize that the implementation of the system, the current operation, operation and the world with the climate epidemic and socioeconomic database. You take care of the world transdisciplinary. Standing for the qualification of the team. As it is, the system included 11, inf 11 infection disease and it again. Please, the next. Synthesis of the scientific advance in the research developers in Cuba during, during the last 30 years has been continued and systematic, where different approaches has been used as a review and established method of the, how the evaluation of the local and national level, the impact of the climbing variability and change of the space, spatial and temporal behavior of virus and bacteria that cause infection diseases. Therefore, climate indicates has been formulated and developed for the disease studies. The next please. This shows example budget with the information police and decision made. Dengue and co circulation risk with the SARS cos through and influenza circulation RXV and real SARS cos through from the climbing variabilities in Cuba. Please, the Marvis R model was used in the country's studies of Panama, Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, Costa Rica, Nicaragua, and Dominican Republic with satisfactory results. This is a schema to the proposed current the project with the French. Climbing health early one existed for the dengue and respiratory infection caused by influenza and SARS-CoV-2 using the Marvel R model. For the implementation early one city were already for the country that has given it its disposition to participate. But we are waiting for the new call for project to be presented for the financing by the agency that 
is interest in the disease proposed collaborative. We have the, the next please. The, we have developed in the case and model spatial time for the studies of impact of the climate variability for the infection diseases, in particular for the danger from a complex approach that has been implemented in modern country of tropical climate. And it can be implemented in the small Iceland developing state. Therefore, we propose the following findings to make. The next. Thank you. Any question, please? Thank you very much, Dr. Ortiz. We'll ask the questions afterwards, so be on standby. Thank you. I saw you joined us um, earlier. Thank you very much. So now I will um, ask Dr. Anna Stewart Ibarra to do her presentation. Over to you, Anna. Thank you, Dr. Paulson Edwards. Uh, let me share my screen and you can tell me how it looks. How does that look? Good? Yes, we're seeing good, thanks. Great. Thank you to the organizers of this session for the opportunity to speak about the co-creation of a dengue early warning system for the health sector in the Caribbean. My name is Anna Stewart Ibarra. I am the science director of the Inter-American Institute for Global Change Research. Today, I'm gonna to share the experience of my team in co-creating a dengue early warning tool for the health sector in Barbados. I'll share some lessons learned and best practices and discuss how this approach is being expanded to other Caribbean countries. Finally, I'll mention opportunities and challenges that we face in operationalizing climate-informed tools for the health sector. In Barbados, the Ministry of Health and Wellness is working with a team of practitioners and researchers to co-create a dengue early warning system. Barbados is a small island developing state located in the Eastern Caribbean. This work began in 2017 under a project coordinated by the Caribbean Institute for Meteorology and Hydrology through the USAID funded Program for Building Regional Climate Capacity in the Caribbean. Subsequent work has been supported by the Red Cross Red Crescent Climate Center. Team members include the Ministry of Health and Wellness, the Barbados Meteorological Services, CIMH and CARFA, and international researchers, including Dr. Rachel Lowe from the London School of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene, and Dr. Sadie Ryan from the University of Florida. Here's a quick overview of the effects of climate on Aedes mosquitoes and the diseases that they carry. Mosquitoes are largely affected by ambient air temperatures because they can't control directly their internal body temperature. Thanks to work led by Dr. Mordecai at Stanford University, we now know that there is a range of possible transmission of arboviruses like dengue, Zika, and chikungunya from 18 to 34 degrees Celsius, and a range of optimum transmission from 26 to 29 degrees Celsius. Here you can see in the figure on the top right that the 80s Egypti mosquito is better able to transmit diseases at warmer temperatures as compared to the 80s albopictus mosquito which is why Aedes aegypti is a vector of greater concern in warmer regions such as the Caribbean. Rainfall is a bit more complicated. The Aedes aegypti mosquito tends to lay its eggs in containers with standing water around the home. And we've seen that both heavy rainfall and drought can increase mosquito larval habitat. Mos rainfall can accumulate in containers around the home. However, drought conditions may have the same effect when people store water around the home, especially in places that lack reliable access to piped water. In the last presentation, Dr. Bulto gave us an excellent example of how we can bring together climate information to create early warning tools to support decision-making in the public health sector. These tools are known as climate services for health. Our team has focused on a collaborative transdisciplinary modeling approach to co-create a dengue early warning tool. In this process, practitioners and scientists from diverse disciplines work together to address a problem. This is considered a best practice for the development of climate services for the health sector. The co-creation process has included an assessment of sectoral needs and priorities, identification of key partners through stakeholder mapping, 
an audit of available health and climate data, cleaning and collating relevant data, co-development of the early warning tool, feedback from practitioners via national and regional consultations, and webinar trainings for climate and health practitioners. We anticipate that through this collaborative transdisciplinary process, the final product is more likely to be relevant, credible, and legitimate, increasing the potential for the climate service to be translated into action by the health sector. Through a series of stakeholder interviews and questionnaires, the team identified a network of agencies and funders engaged in climate arbovirus surveillance and control. Organizations in black are current functioning partnerships and organizations in red are partnerships that need to be strengthened by the health sector as identified by health sector interviewees and climate sector interviewees. The team indicated importantly that no formal collaboration existed between the national climate and health sectors. And this was identified as a potential barrier to the implementation of a dengue early warning tool. The team identified a number of best practices to strengthen intersectoral climate and health partnerships and to elevate climate impacts on the national health agenda. One partner from the climate sector summed up the need to build these relationships across the sectors. He said, just sitting with the people in the sectors makes such a big difference. Understand them, what drives them, what are their needs? Because we might think they need something that they don't. And sometimes it's about forgetting yourself and putting yourself in the other person's shoes to really figure out what the need is about. That's true engagement. The team also learned about existing capacities that could be leveraged and capacities that need to be strengthened to be able to implement a dengue early warning system. Strengths included effective health messaging, health surveillance infrastructure, coordination with other institutions and communities, and general knowledge of the effects of climate on health. They noted a gap in technical expertise in statistics, data management, and GIS. They identified the need for training and how to analyze and interpret basic climate information and how to integrate this information into health surveillance and planning. They also identified a lack of sustained funding as a potential barrier to the implementation of a dengue early warning system. The team was able to successfully develop a dengue forecast model that used climate information to predict the risk of dengue outbreaks three months in advance. This experience taught the team about the value of collaborative data analysis and how climate information could potentially be used by the health sector to inform decision-making in Barbados. Through the modeling process, the team learned that both excess rainfall and drought conditions could increase the risk of dengue outbreaks at different timeframes. Wetter conditions increase the likelihood of a dengue outbreak up to two months later, likely due to the accumulation of rainwater. Surprisingly, drought conditions also increase the likelihood of a dengue outbreak three to five months later, likely due to water storage in uncovered containers around the home during times of water scarcity. In water scarce countries like Barbados, household water storage has been promoted as a climate change adaptation strategy. This finding taught the team about the need to collaborate with urban planners and other stakeholders involved with building ordinances that regulate storage of water storage around the home. These findings were cited in the December 2020 edition of the Caribbean Health Climatic Bulletin advising public health stakeholders of the risk of increased dengue transmission following a widespread drought in the first half of 2020, followed by warm temperatures and excess rainfall, particularly in the Eastern Caribbean. The team is now working to find solutions to host the early warning tool online and ensure its sustainability. One promising approach is to use the climate services online platform that is currently hosted by the Barbados Meteorological Services on their website. They issue warnings on a range of meteorologic, meteorological hazards that have health implications. The team is exploring ways to translate probabilistic outbreak forecasts into impact level alerts using decision matrices. This would allow the alert message to combine the level of certainty in the forecast with urgency for action, similar to other impact-based forecasting tools hosted by the Barbados Meteorological Service. This experience in Barbados provides an operational modeling framework for an arbovirus early warning tool. A number of innovations emerged during this process, including the use of a drought indicator as a predictor of dengue risk and translating the model into an impact-based forecast. 
The model uses climate indicators that are routinely monitored and forecasted by the Regional Climate Center of uh, the Caribbean Institute for Meteorology and Hydrology. We are currently working with regional partners to expand these efforts to other Caribbean countries. In the future, quantitative estimates of dengue risk could also be incorporated into national climate health bulletins and the regional health climatic bulletin or other decision support platforms for the health sector. The process of developing a dengue early warning tool revealed a number of challenges and opportunities. First, we need to address the institutional context that can facilitate or limit the implementation of a climate tool in the health sector. This includes the willingness and ability of institutions to engage in cross-sectoral work and to share data, especially sensitive health data. This also includes an assessment of the partners who should be at the table. For example, the disaster risk reduction sector is a natural partner that has been largely missing from discussions of climate services for the health sector. And there's an opportunity to better engage with the disaster sector. There is also a need for scientific studies that assess the feasibility of implementing early warning systems for the health sector. The field of implementation science can provide valuable information to help scale up climate change adaptation measures like early warning systems by identifying bottlenecks and gaps in institutional processes. Second, with respect to climate and health data, there is an opportunity to create and strengthen integrated climate health surveillance systems and observatories and develop climate and health data harmonization and data sharing protocols. A forecast model is only as good as the data that goes into it. In some cases, earth observations can be used to fill gaps. Finally, there's an opportunity to create and sustain a cohort of climate health practitioners across the region. There is a need for joint trainings for climate and health professionals and to create supported career, path, career paths at the climate health interface. You can read more about this collaborative process of co-learning in a recent report published by the WHO entitled Learning Health Systems Pathways to Progress and in a recent publication entitled Building Resilience to Mosquito-Borne Diseases in the Caribbean. Thank you for the opportunity to participate in this session and I look forward to answering any questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Stuart Ibarra, for that very interesting um, presentation and overview. So I'm going to now ask Dr. Medlock to do his um, presentation. Over to you, Julian. Good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm going to talk about um, challenges posed by hurricanes to vector control, uh, some experiences in the British overseas territories uh, following the hurricanes Irma and Maria. Next slide, please. Aedes aegypti is uh, the main vector of chikungunya. There are various serotypes of dengue and Zika. There's also Aedes albopictus in some of the islands as well. And of course, these remain one of the biggest challenges to, to public health in the Caribbean. The key reason why mosquitoes have adapted uh, to survive in our environment is that they survive around our homes. They can breed in the water that we store. They cause peri-domestic biting and of course can transmit viruses that cause epidemics. So maintaining mosquito free habitats really is a not only a public but also a private oh. sector a project and it requires great leadership and community compliance. Uh, the best efforts of course are ruined by a hurricane. These drastically and profoundly challenge vector control and our ability to control mosquitoes. Next slide please. So what are the elements of an efficient vector control? Everybody probably has a different opinion on this, but I think strong links with the community, getting community compliance is absolutely critical. Uh, any best endeavor can break down if there's no community compliance. Building uh, knowledge, entomological knowledge, ecological knowledge of mosquitoes, mosquito diversity, uh, the kind of habitats uh, and the disease risk is critical, both within vector control and within government. That may well involve running sentinel mosquito trap surveillance systems, having a process of seek and destroy to identify problem areas and, and targeting larvicidal and dulticidal control. Um, understanding societal compliance, why would communities decide to or not decide to comply with their own uh, vet control systems in, in their backyards? Um, understanding what role insecticides have and whether there's resistance, making sure that the right insecticides are used in, in, uh, for environmental reasons and also to target specific marsh or, or Aedes aegypti mosquitoes. But really it all comes down to resources and infrastructure. If a small island state has insufficient number of staff, insufficient number of vehicles, it's unable to perform vector control efficiently. And this comes from st strong leadership and buy-in at a government level. Next slide, please. 
So I see that there are two key challenges uh, for vector control. The first one is all about management of water systems. Here you can see uh, a system of water capture in Bermuda, uh, capturing water under in cisterns under, underneath uh, houses. And one of the key issues here is that um, there needs to be correct mesh size on the input and outputs of, of, the, of the water systems, ensuring that water is uh, managed both within the planning system and ensuring that they don't provide habitats for mosquitoes. This is an issue of some of the coral islands. Next slide, please. Most, throughout most of the Caribbean, particularly in the UK overseas territories, a lot of water is captured in, in drums and these proliferate uh, all over the islands and uh, cause a, a reason for uh, new habitats for mosquitoes to develop. Next slide, please. In places like Grenada and, uh, and next slide, please. And also in Dominica, there've been a whole program of um, drum cover projects aimed to target interventions at these drums, at uh, these drum habitats. There's also systems of collection of city water in tanks, and these all need to be stored in a way in which they don't provide habitats for mosquitoes. Next slide, please. Second challenge is the management of waste. Um, this can be at an individual level, actions within people's backyards, community action where we're managing waste within village, town communities, and also at a national level, an instance here where uh, litter collects underneath the, the rainwater guts underneath roads. So there are many sort of lessons from COVID, I think, on minimizing disease risk, and these really stretch towards behavioral science and the research and understanding perhaps behavioral science compliance towards controlling mosquitoes and how we can engage the community better. So the post hurricane really, the focus really ought to be on vector control, managing and treating waste in key areas, particularly in those low socioeconomic communities. Bush hides waste, and we all know that. City cleanups prior to the hurricane event is, is always important. Next slide, please. So what happens to mosquitoes during and post hurricane? Well, Aedes aegypti, like all Aedes mosquitoes, have developed strategies to survive without water. It's likely that some mosquitoes, uh, most mosquitoes will be unable to seek shelter and be blown away, but adults, uh, mosquitoes will find shelter within buildings within systems, larvae will remain in, within underground systems, underground water supplies and within water tanks. And of course, critically, eggs remain dormant for long periods of time. And these can be disseminated by um, during, during the hurricane, which really litter the whole islands with a whole range of containers that can be heavily exploited by the mosquitoes following heavy rains. So what we're left with is not only coastal flooding, which can cause issues for marsh mosquitoes, but a range of container habitats that really um, provide habitats for, for mosquitoes to develop rapidly. Sealed habitats can become breached, particularly within systems, and any green that's been lost in houses can increase exposure to, to mosquito biting. Next slide, please. So rapid vector control, the ideal scenario would be that you identify the problem areas for vector control, set up a network of adult tracks to target where these mosquito biting areas are, focus efforts towards the worst hit areas or the lower socioeconomic status uh, localities and communities, remove bulk bulky waste, particularly where there's high density mosquitoes, ensuring that we refit mesh on the systems, replacing gauze on the out outlet pipes, uh, screening windows, ensuring that all the drums that are collecting water are, are screened, uh, and of course, deploying larva sides uh, where they're needed and adulter sides. Next slide, please. But that's not really the reality. The reality is that uh, for the vector control staff, there are human resource issues. There may well be uh, injury or death within the family of the vector control team. A team that is already stretched, even in peacetime, becomes extra st stretched during the hurricane system, uh, situation. Their focus is perhaps on restoration of their own personal property or even uh, relocating to other islands where they may have family. They can also be damaged to facilities. This is the uh, Anguillan Vector Control Office uh, post Irma. Uh, it's, it's unable to really function as a vector control team when most of the equipment has been lost and there's no viable laboratory to be able to identify or run any specimens. Um, often vehicles are lost as well. This is an up down, upside down ambulance on Anguilla um, or any vehicles that are available are redeployed to other public health departments. There can be a loss of equipment, both for um, lava siding or even sentinel traps, and really a lack of infrastructure with the loss of electricity, unable to um, deploy staff and equipment throughout the island. 
Next slide, please. So what about uh, the reality for community response? I've already said that uh, vector control is very reliant upon compliance of communities to ensure that everybody does their bit to control mosquitoes and particularly in, in water that's uh, stored around the home. But of course, the community have bigger issues to deal with. It's focused on restoring their housing, restoring their livelihoods. So what we need to uh, do really is, you know, ensure that we have a system uh, whereby vector control can facilitate rapidly the uh, deployment of vector control strategies to the community. And that may well be on communities that are without pipe water, may, may be sort of proliferating a range of drums to collect rainwater for their own drinking water, securing systems with mesh, ensuring that any relief and aid comes quickly and is appropriate. And these aid requests can be slow, it can be customs import issues, complex procurement process, it can be many months before any aid is um, delivered to an island post hurricane. So perhaps there need to be emergency stockpiles which can be maintained and secured ahead of time. And in archipelago states, often the, that focus may be on the main island rather than some of the off offshore islands. Next slide, please. Of course, there's the question of fogging. You know, why do we fog? When do we fog? Is it right to fog? Is it because of increasing mosquitoes from nuisance reports, a disease outbreak? Should it be done every week? Really, it comes down to public expectation, perhaps, and also political requests. And there's a range of, of research that can be done to understand what impacts insecticidal fogging has on, on mosquito populations and, and what's appropriate. Next slide, please. So really, we've been thinking about building disaster resilience within the vector control team. And we're, we're talking really about, um, you know, what do we do um, this issue with provision of temporary accommodation? It may well be with the loss of, of buildings, actually containers need to be deployed, rapid mobile laboratories need to be deployed so that vector control teams can, can get up to speed, have somewhere to, to uh, store all their equipment and then operate rapidly in the event of uh, an outbreak that might follow a hurricane event. Ensuring that the aid is provided timely and targeted, having a list of resources that an inventory that already exists and that, that may be rapidly requested and, and deployed to the islands. Mutual aid is going to be critical, ensuring that there are staff in neighbouring islands that perhaps missed out on the hurricane that can be deployed to help with the effort. So the sorts of disaster resilience resources is a list there of, of things, ensuring the of traps that uh, are stored in a way that to a, avoid impact from the hurricane stock of mesh for securing systems, drum covers if that's required appropriate, larvicidal or dulticidal uh, products that, that are required, and, in, and public communication, uh, bearing in mind that there are other things that the public community need to focus on. Next slide, please. So some of the take home messages, really. Well, hurricanes will lead to more habitats for mosquitoes through the breakdown of both water and waste systems, which are already a challenge, even in peacetime. And these will increase exposure of people to bites and the virus if these are circulating, which could lead to epidemics. So there's a need to be thinking ahead of time about how we prepare for hurricanes, for vector control, how we build resilience, how we build um, a post-hurricane response plan, um, stockpiling equipment, ensuring that there's cross-government response and support, island cleanups and risk communication ahead of time and ahead of the, the hurricane season. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Julian. So now I'm gonna ask all the presenters to turn your cameras on and um, we'll have a discussion. We have a, a couple of questions, um, but we're, we're talking about research and we're talking about implementation. The research is to give us the evidence that we need to make the business case to get the resources that we need to do what we have to do. And I'm referring really to the Caribbean Action Plan on Health and Climate Change, which was um, done in 2018 as part of this SIDS initiative. And, um, you know, I, I'll start with Jolion actually, because you, you were mentioning, speaking about the issues related to vector control and the hurricanes and so on. And the question I have to you is, um, you know, how can we build the um, build more build up the role of the vector control officers themselves to provide greater resilience to vector borne disease management in the Caribbean region? Thanks, Karen. Um, I, I believe we need to empower our vector control teams primarily, uh, and I think um, some of this work is being done by CARFA. I know, and some of the experience we've had 
with entomologists within Europe as part of the VetsNet project is establishing a network of vet control officers across the region um, so that they meet regularly, whether that be um, you know, remotely, uh, and can start to share experiences, promote good practice, ensuring that our vet control officers are accredited and respected within the community, respected within government, there's a clear career path, um, and perhaps even a, an opportunity for a flow of vector control officers to move from island to island. This builds opportunity for those the staff, it increases the, um, in, improves the environment within they, which they work. And then they may well return to their islands with new practices they've learned in, in other parts of the Caribbean. And I've already mentioned mutual aid. I think uh, if there are good practices in one island, they should be encouraged to share. And I think uh, regular meetings and regular fora is really the key. And over 10 years of, of doing something similar in Europe, we now have a network where if you have a question, if you have something that's troubling you, you can contact a range of people across a 50 different states in Europe and say, how do you do this? How did you manage that? And I think that's uh, something I would promote. Thank you, thank you. I have this question I'm gonna to pose to Dr. Ortiz. Dengue is not one disease. How does your work take account of the four different types of dengue? So we're talking about the early warning systems being developed for dengue and I'll ask, um, Anna to win after also, but saying dengue is not one disease. How does your work take into account the four different types of dengue? Excuse me. The use is of the dengue of the different of the uh, according to the uh, virus, virus, virus. Uh, the zero, uh, one, two, three, or four viral of the dengue is very too important, including of the model. No circulation, the one period uh, or, uh, or similar similar circulation in other period. It's very too important, including uh, this is information in this model. Uh, the uses uh, interrelation change of the lack of circulation of the different uh, uh, viral or the dengue uh, of one, two, or one, two, three, or in this moment of the circulation of the four cell uh, types in this moment. This is very too important to the old brain of the case study. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ortiz. I know you want to weigh in on that also. Sure, just brief comments. As Dr. Ortiz mentioned, it's incredibly important to have information about the serotypes that are in circulation. Um, in many places, we lack longitudinal data sets with uh, information about the serotypes that are prevalent in the population. And so that makes it difficult to develop uh, the kind of forecast models that we're talking about here. Uh, some work that we did previously in Ecuador, we did include a predictor, which was the number of serotypes in circulation, which is a crude way to estimate risk. And that was found to be significant. In the Barbados model, we are not using information on serotypes, um, but certainly that's an area where uh, it's important to add that information for sure. Thank you. Okay, another question. Um, any suggestions on how to break down the silos between health and the climate services or environment stakeholders? I think, Anna, you mentioned in your talk about the um, working together, the network of different agencies working together and institutions. So the question is geared toward uh, how do we break down the silos between health and climate services? Thanks, Karen. Uh brief response, but we can talk about at the individual level, the personal relationships and developing those, those relationships over time, which is I think critically important. And by to do that, we have to create joint spaces for dialogue and training, which could be regular quarterly meetings between the epidemiologist and representatives from the Met services to review upcoming seasonal climate forecasts and to come up with an understanding of how that affects health outcomes. Uh, but at a national sort of institutional level, What's really important and has come up in some of the interviews that we did was the need for mandates in the health sector and in the climate sector to address the impacts of climate on health because without that mandate, it is more difficult to allocate resources, be it people, personnel that are dedicated to this issue. 
And so uh, having a, a mandate to address climate and health would be an important step forward to strengthen the partnership at a, at a formal level. One last thing I'll mention, at a regional level in the Caribbean, certainly CARFA and CIMH have played an important leadership role when they formalized their collaboration in 2017 by signing an MOU. And I think that's important to note because they have helped to push forward the, the climate and health agenda at the regional level. Thank you very much. Uh, question for you, Julian. How do you see the interaction of mental health issues and vector-borne diseases post-disaster? Oh, that's a tricky one. I mean, I think um, I, I alluded to the fact that um, uh, the public have many other challenges uh, post-hurricane. And of course, mental health issues is, is a major consideration there. And I think even actually in, in, in non-hurricane seasons, there are lots of other challenges for the community to deal with. Uh, and uh, you know, dealing with mosquitoes and, and preventing mosquito biting and, and, and their role in, in, in contributing to community is not always high on the priority. Um, and I think this really is an area that we, we need to work on in trying to understand some of the behavioral science aspects of, of compliance. Um, and the mental health issues may well be one of those contributory factors. Poverty may well be another, socioeconomic factors and, and whether the rest of the community are complying. Um, I think this is a, one of the massive challenges really for um, sort of these sorts of mosquito-borne diseases, compliance in, in controlling mosquitoes. So I think it's a critical element of it. Uh, and I think obviously the, the mental health aspects of post-hurricane is uh, further exacerbates the situation that probably exists um, endemically. Thank you. Um, there is another question here. What are the differences between understanding determinants of dengue versus determinants of Zika or chikungunya? So I guess this relates to the, the early, the, the developing the models and the early warning systems. Um, are the determinants for dengue different from chikungunya, different from Zika? How do you incorporate that kind of information into models uh, or your early warning systems? Um, Dr. Ortiz, you want to have a go? I'm not sure. It's very important to uh, the, uh, the join of the climbing information and different uh, information entomological to con, uh, create of the uh, database of join according to the scaling, uh, the, the different scaling, and uh, prepare of the grid uh, specific for the health sector. Different uh, sectors. Uh, all, all aspects, all aspects is uh, necessary to consider the launch of, of, of data, uh, the possibility of data availability data, availability data is necessary no, no uh, the equal period uh, in, include uh, this is after in, 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 the, in the different model the chikungunya is the different behavior a uh, dengue uh, or, or zero type uh, or, or zero type uh, the dengue and uh, malaria is different in cues of the mechanics of the relationships of the climbing variability. The in, in, uh, the different the behavior of the vector and often an aedes aegypti. The different uh, uh, situation, uh, the habitat and uh, different situation of the uh, increments of the temperature and rainfall or of the drugs consideration. For example, if you use uh, the, the vegetation index, it is, is uh, possible to apply on the model of the dengue and the malaria fever. Um, and the Zika is no less in this moment. Uh, the uses or input, uh, this is information. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. So how, with all the, the research that we've been doing, um, the, the, the models and the early warning systems, 
how does your work strengthen health system response in terms of adopting a proactive approach? So now we come to the implementation. So we have these models develop these early warning systems. How do we integrate those into the health system response um, to adopt a proactive approach? Um, Anna, you wanna have a go at it first? Sure, thank you. Um, and just also to add a comment to uh, Dr. Ortiz's last uh, sure. comments, there has been some research to suggest that uh, Zika responds differently to a Zika infection in mosquitoes responds differently than dengue. And so the, there's a different temperature response. You can't just apply the same model to each. And colleagues uh, like Dr. Sadie Ryan have done global models to show how climate change would affect the distribution of dengue versus Zika in different manners based on that biological relationship. So, and following up on your question about the health system response, um, part of what we've noted as sort of the immediate outcomes has been this, what we call health system learning through this collaborative process. And so uh, sort of in the short term, our colleagues from the health sector have discussed their, um, their interest and their, to use information such as the Health Climatic Bulletin that is being issued by uh, PAHO, CIMH, and CARFA uh, to inform their decision-making and to bring that kind of bulletin into their routine meetings uh, to make decisions about, for example, upcoming vector season. And, and so this sort of joint learning process between the health sector, climate sector, and other partners has been an important first step to increase the resilience of the health system. And I'll stop there. Thank you. And just um, one final question then. Um, how do we move the, the, from the research to the field or to the ground? How do we get this information into a, a frame or into a manner that is easily understandable to the um, average person on the street? How do we translate these models um, for, for persons to be able to understand what it is that we're saying or you know, the importance of it? Um, I'll give that one to Julian and then. We'll Probably wrap. a question for Anna and Paolo, but I, <laughs> or, I, yes. I, think, I think it comes back to my, my point earlier on and that is, it's ensuring that we've got the right linkages between the scientists doing the research and the, the modelers to the people on the ground responsible for vector control and dealing with the issues. And that when you've got something that has epidemics that come every few years, it's all about keeping sustainability during peacetime. We have to ensure, and it varies from one island state to another, I know that, we have to ensure that we have a really robust, sustainable, well-trained, well-motivated, well-resourced vector control system that is operating well in peacetime. And then when the epidemic comes along, they can either avert it or they have the capacity to deal with it. And I think it's very well having lots of models to say this is going to happen. But if there's no one on the ground and no vehicles to move people around and not the right resources and the inappropriate control strategies, we're always going to struggle. Thank you very much. And um, we're almost out of time. So I'm just going to give each person a few seconds. Any final words or any take home message that you would want to leave with our, our, our audience? Dr. Ortiz, any final words? Define, please define it uh, according to the uh, comment uh, uh, between uh, in the next uh, intervention of the Cuba and um, presentation of experience and the use of this information, the uh, health sector according to climate information and climate prediction. Next uh, the next service. Uh, uh, it's necessary to transdisciplinary and capacity building in different uh, 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 group science uh, and community. This is, is very, very important to uh, um, uh, implement of the everyone system a living community. Thank you very much. And I think I think Dr. Ortiz summed it up perfectly. So Anna, unless you have any burning comment, I think Julian made his last ones already. Um, Make one last comment that in 
we had corresponded about this previously. What I think about this boils down to is how do we create equitable partnerships and recognize the tremendous leadership and experience in the Caribbean region from partners here. And really the Caribbean region is playing a leadership role at a global scale in terms of pushing forward uh, knowledge and innovation on climate services for health. And this will also require a change in how we do science and moving beyond colonial models of science um, so that we can recognize contributions from all partners and to think about creating tools that are actually useful and usable by the end users. So those are my final thoughts. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'd like to thank you all for your participation. Thank you for your presentations and have a good evening all. Thank you.